I will start out with this slide every time, uh, several different under definitions of what philosophy means, and especially the one I have highlighted here, which is the one I think sums it up best. Uh, philosophy is the attempt to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to attain knowledge and wisdom about them. Now, right now, you may not have a perception, as you studied epistemology last week and metaphysics this week, you may not have as immediate an understanding of how this helps you think rationally and critically about life's most important questions, but it really does. Um, you all are, to some extent, because the terminology is new to you, etc., um, you're in the first stages of basic training and we're expecting you to go out and run, you know, four miles. There's no real better way to do this unless we decided we were going to do eight courses of it. You know, then, then I can spoon feed you or the book can spoon feed you. But you, you, we sort of have to throw you into the deep end and that's how you're learning to swim. But as you get into it, you'll understand more and more, and again, you'll see some of that today, I think, how these kinds of questions and struggling with this and learning this stuff will help you think better, will help you understand some of the issues that really are at stake and teach you to respond as a Christian with a Christian worldview to the rest of the world. We've talked quite a bit already about the fact that um, Christians have made a terrible mistake of either being anti-intellectual, actively against being intellectual and pursuing intellectual things, or else have been so passive about it that we've lost the ability to think well. And the world has taken advantage of that. That's why we're, you know, we're playing catch-up. And so that's much of what we're doing. So today, we're going to talk about metaphysics. I want to start out by saying the first, first thing that the book does, and I really do think this is quite a good book, you need to realize that they're giving you any one of these topics, epistemology, there are libraries full of books on epistemology. There are, you know, people, major, they do PhDs in epistemology, or metaphysics, or ontology, which is only one part of metaphysics, etc., etc., etc. Ethics, philosophy of science, philosophy of religion. They're trying to give you an introduction to all of that, and as a result, in order to still be fairly comprehensive, it ends up being very dense, because they push a lot of stuff together in order to give it as an introduction. That's one of the dangers of an introduction is that, again, unless you want to do it over 16 weeks, uh, or 16 courses, rather, uh, you run into problems. One of the things that they did here that I don't think necessarily was the best idea is they start out this section of metaphysics introducing you to two of the major things that have been used, uh, done in opposition to classical or traditional metaphysics. And I want to mention those very briefly. Again, I, to me, and I said this to Carolyn, to give you two things that are against metaphysics, when they haven't yet explained to you what metaphysics is, seems to be a little bit putting the cart before the horse. Okay, and I think that may have thrown some people off. Um, I want to let me explain something about about those two very quickly, and then we, we can move on to the content. Uh, Immanuel Kant, German philosopher, pretty widely considered the most important philosopher that ever lived. Okay, there are a few people that I mean, you might say Plato or Aristotle. Some Catholic scholars especially might say Thomas Aquinas, but Kant had more impact than almost anybody. Very simply, Kant responded to David Hume. I've said to you before that there was a point in my life in college where my trinity was Kant, Hume, and Hegel, G.F.W. Hegel, who came after Kant. And it's, there's a sequence, Hume, Kant, and Hegel, uh, each of them sort of interpreting and, and uh, applying people that came before. Well, Immanuel Kant, German philosopher, said that he was awakened from his dogmatic slumber by the writings of uh, the Scottish philosopher David Hume. When Hume challenged, Hume introduced radical skepticism, which basically said, you can't know anything for sure, because everything you think you know has come through filters, and everything you think you know is based upon what has happened previously, and you don't know for sure that it's going to happen that way next time. So he questioned even the idea of cause and effect. That the same thing happening now that happened before will not, even if it's absolutely identical, it will not necessarily, you can't guarantee or know that it's going to produce the same results. We talked about that last week in epistemology. Well, the end result of that, if you really draw it to its logical conclusion, human skepticism, is you couldn't do science, for instance. Because science is based upon observable phenomena, empirical data, that you draw conclusions from that tell you where you go next. Well, Hume's radical skepticism says just because you observed it once doesn't mean it's going to happen again. So there is no such thing as empirical data that you can base any future 
science on. It, it called into question any sense of the divine. How can we know the divine since we can't really <coughs> perceive it? All right. Uh, so Kant comes along and he's trying to deal with some of that in order to try to undercut Hume's skepticism. He agreed a lot with what Hume said, but he wanted to undercut it by saying, you know, there is such a thing as cause and effect and we can rely on it. But the way Hume answered that thing is he said, we don't rely on cause and effect as an external thing that's happening in the world that we can observe and rely on. But instead, cause and effect is a real thing that our mind overlays. And I'm using cause and effect as one example. Cause and effect is overlaid on what we experience by our mind, but that doesn't make it any less real. So Kant's big deal is to try to figure out how does the mind receive this input and then organize it in such a way that it makes sense, saying that the way our mind organize, organizes reality is just as much a part of what reality is as what's happening outside of us. You get that? That that's still a real thing. And the mind, one of the things that the mind does is it organizes things in terms of cause and effect. If this happens, that happens. And if this happens in exactly the same way, that same thing is going to happen again. The mind applies that. So a lot of what uh, Kant did in Critique of Pure Reason and Critique of, of uh, Practical Reason, two of his major works, although what's quoted in here is actually a preliminary to those, was he tried to define how does the mind take in information and how does it process it and what does that have to do with our understanding of what is real. So it is both an epistemological approach, meaning how do we know, and it's a metaphysical approach in terms of what is reality. How do we know what is reality? Those two things obviously go together. Epistemology and metaphysics fit together. Epistemology, how do we know things? Metaphysics, what is real? Now, um, I want to say, on, in your books, on page 149, there's a little chart, a diagram there of a person looking at a pine tree, and then it, he actually lists. Kant said that the two, there were two intuitions, two sort of major categories that we organize things by, space and time. We experience things in space and in time. And then he identified 12 categories, which are actually, they're not listed in the text, but they're listed here. Unity, plurality, totality, reality, negation, limitation, etc. This diagram is either wrong or it's, or it's presented poorly. Because Kant identified the things that are in the real world outside ourselves, he called the noumena, based on the word numinous, which means mysterious. We can never fully actually really know. That's numinous. But when we take in this, these impressions, these images, these thoughts, these the experiences that we have from our senses, he called those the phenomena. Now, this makes it look like the phenomena is the real thing, and the noumena is what's happening in our head. Those two things, again, it's a, the chart is poorly drawn. The noumena would be the real pine tree, as it exists apart from us, whether we ever saw it or not. The, the phenomena would be how we take that in. Now, in the text for this week, something I should have said last week because I was actually thinking about it. People think it's a common sense approach to say, well, that's silly. You see a pine tree, it's a real pine tree, it's really there. Because most people wrongly, and again, they talked about it in here, and I meant to talk about this last week, they, when we talked about how we know things, epistemology. They assume that our eyes are like window, windows. And so whatever's on the other side of that, we're perceiving that, and it's real, and you know, what's the problem? Well, think about it. you don't have to think about it for just a second to understand that's not true. My eyes are not panes of clear glass through which things are being seen. But in fact, light is striking an object. That light enters in through my cornea. It strikes nerves, rods and cones, in the back of my eye, in my retina, that get translated into electrical impulses through my optical nerve that reach my brain, and my brain then, through some fairly mysterious chemical process, translates that into an image. How do I know that that's all correct? You understand? The idea that we're just looking through a pane of glass that, of course, there's the tree, I can see it, it's real, what's the problem? Seeing is believing. Really? Or can we be sure of that? So Kant was trying to help us understand the way in which those images get brought in, how we can know them, epistemology, and then how our brain organizes them and how that affects what knowledge is in us. 
Const ideas were extraordinary, but most of it he just made this stuff up, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Now he affected, he, his work, whatever part of it is correct or incorrect, his work then influenced every other major thinker after him, in terms of whether they agreed with him, disagreed with him. In fact, we have a section in here where Alvin Plantinga, the most important philosopher probably alive today, a Christian philosopher, reformed theologian who loved Jesus, and is almost single-handedly reintroduced natural theology and natural philosophy in the world, um, an astonishing feat. He, re he basically says Kant didn't get it right. <laughs> so we don't have to accept everything Kant said, but that we do have to accept the fact that historically his ideas affected all the thinking after him. Everybody had to respond to Kant after that. Agree with him, disagree with him, differ on parts of it, whatever. So that, but because Kant argued that a large part of what is real is what my mind organizes my sensory impressions on and decides what's real, then he introduced or actually emphasized a fairly extreme subjectivism. It's my brain that's deciding what reality is. Okay? And that had, a, had an effect. We can see that downstream in terms of what happened after him. You see why I'm saying that? If reality is what my mind, after going, through, you know, after having all these sense impressions, touch, feel, hearing, sight, um, coming through my organs of sense, being filtered, my brain organizes it. If my brain is organizing reality, then my brain has a huge part in deciding what, re what is real. And so therefore, it brings us back to, well, how do you know that's real? The other thing, I'm going to do very simply, logical positivism, which came from the Vienna group, um, were a group of scientists, basically, or scientifically oriented people. This was at the Enlightenment as science was gaining. They basically said, if you can't prove it with science, it can't be true. And they created what's called the verification principle. There are several versions of it, which basically said, unless you can empirically demonstrate that a statement or a proposition is true, scientifically, then you can't believe it's true. Well, as the authors of the book say, <laughs> the big problem they have is that you can't empirically, scientifically prove that the verification principle is true. You can't apply experimental evidence to prove that their statement about what is true is true. You see that? So it's self-defeating. It's logically, you know, uh, a circle. So I wanted to explain those two things to you. Also to say that that with Hume, and with Kant especially, and some who came after them, the book mentions, and doesn't explain why, that metaphysics has not really been done seriously for, throughout the whole 18th, or throughout the whole 19th and early and 20th centuries. Until fairly recently in the 20th century, then we did pick it up again. And Alvin Plantinga is one of the people who helped with that. Um, the reason was because Kant, with his radical skepticism, saying you can't know anything for sure, and then, or I'm sorry, hey, uh, Hume, and then Kant saying everything is ultimately subjective because it's how your brain processes everything, it basically, no matter, when philosophers after those two and some of the others, Hegel a little bit and others, although Hegel was trying to actually oppose those ideas, um, no matter what a philosopher proposed, the radical skeptics in the epistemology group would say, but you can't know that, but you can't know that. How can you know that? You don't know that. You can't very well do philosophy is that if the response you get every time is, but you don't know that. You can't say that. You have no basis on which to say that because you don't know. That's just what you perceive. Your perceptions are faulty. You don't know. You see that? You see why that's a problem? And epistemology has held the whole rest of philosophy captive for 150 years. Because the response from the skeptical epistemologist was always, you don't know that. You can't say that. You don't have any basis on that because you don't know. It's just what you think your perceptions are telling you. But they could be wrong. So you don't know. Which I studied epistemology probably more than any other aspect of philosophy. And it, it's very frustrating. It's, it's like the example I gave you last week or the week before that, you know, P.B. Herman. I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? Whatever you say, I know you are, but what am I? That's sort of what the skeptical epistemologists were saying when they said, but you can't know that. You don't know that. You can't say that because you don't know. You don't know. It's just your perceptions. Fortunately, we've sort of gotten past that. Okay. Partly because of the work of some very good philosophers who have said, you know, that's, that doesn't really work. Okay. That's all the prolegomena. That's, that's all the 
the preface to it. I want to talk about now, let's get into metaphysics, and if you weren't here for the earlier lectures, contrary to the way I usually say it, I am going to work through the book, because this, some of this stuff is very difficult to understand, and so I'm going to deal with the book as it goes, and I'm going to talk about these topics, give you definitions, and as I said earlier, if you heard me talking to Chris, whereas they have to write a book, I can give you an outline, and an outline in, some way, in many ways is easier to understand, because I don't have to have all the extra verbiage in there. Um, and so the outline hopefully will help. Metaphysics. Metaphysics is perhaps the oldest branch of philosophy. It is the branch of philosophy that is concerned with what is the nature of reality. It, it seeks to answer the question, the ultimate question is, what is real? And people go, oh, duh, but the, the ramifications of this are very great. Because if two people have a very different understanding about the nature of a thing being real or not real, then obviously they're going to draw different conclusions. And I'll give you some ethical implications of that as we go along. Some of the metaphysical questions beyond what is real, what is the nature of the world? What is it made of? Is what we see, hear, and touch the real world? So you can see how epistemology, how do we know, is related to metaphysics, what is real? Or is what we see, hear, and touch only the shadow of something else that is more real and significant? Is there a spiritual dimension? Is there a spiritual world? We can't see angels, usually. Does that mean they're not real? Or can they be real? You begin to see the ramifications for religious belief here. Is there reality beyond the physical universe? Is there a God? Well, how you define what is real will greatly affect whether or not you have room in your metaphysics for the existence of a divine spiritual being. Are there other spiritual beings? Do humans have a soul that is eternal? Is, eternal? is anything eternal? Is there anything beyond the material, physical world? You see why those questions are important? Now, particularly, I'll just introduce you to ontology here, and it may come up later on. Um, one of the arguments for God is called the ontological argument, by, that, that by definition, uh, God has to, has to be, he has to exist by the fact that we conceive of him as being existing. I'm not going to get into that anymore, but that ontology is important in terms of religious understanding and belief. Ontology is a subset of metaphysics that deals with being. That is, what does it mean to exist? What does it mean to be? What is existence? Obviously, that is a factor in what we believe is real, because if it doesn't exist, it can't be real. Alright? Questions about that? That's just sort of where we're going with this. This is the definition. Remember, I mean, taking notes is great because it will help you remember, but all of this stuff is available online. I don't know, I got it to you later. Are you up yet? No. Oh, I, I didn't even see it. No. Okay. Yeah, I, did, I, I thought that might be the case. Alright? So this is metaphysics. The most basic metaphysical question is, what is the underlying nature of reality? What makes something real? The earliest philosophers, and again the book talks about this, the early Greek philosophers, starting with, with Thales, or Thales, um, in almost 600, not quite 600 BC, so we're talking 2,600 years ago, tried to figure out what is everything made out of. Now, Thales proposed that it was all made out of water, and one of the reasons he did that is because water is the one element that he could see that has both a solid form, a liquid form, and a gaseous form. And so it appeared that everything solid, liquid, or gas was made out of the stuff in some combination, some density, actually, he would say. And there was an extent to which he wasn't far wrong. You know, the human body, the solid stuff, is 70% water. So it's not quite as crazy as you might think. All organic material, especially, has a significant amount of water in it. Not only that, but hydrogen and oxygen are two of the most basic elements in most things. You add carbon and you get almost all the stuff that we're aware of. I mean, there's smaller amounts of other uh, elements in this. Others proposed that it was made out of fire. Some talked about, well, and I, I mentioned atoms here. You may not be aware of the fact that Democritus, over 2,000 years ago, came up with the first idea that all things are made out of tiny particles called atoms. Now, Democritus thought that that those atoms were all the same thing. 
basically that there was some unknown element, which he called atoms, which made up everything. And he was pretty much right. I mean, there's a lot more truth to these guys than, than people might have thought. For most of the 2,500 years since then, people would have thought Democritus was kind of, you know, off the wall. And then we discovered atoms and found out he knew a lot more than we thought he did. Now again, he thought all those atoms were the same. And the principle that he proposed is called atomism. Another, and probably one of the dominant ones, and this is all the way up through fairly modern times, all the way through the Middle Ages, was the belief that there were four basic elements. And you've heard this if you've ever watched a movie that you know, took place more than 200 years ago. The idea of earth, air, fire, and water were the four elements, and everything was made up of some combination of those. This is the basic principle behind alchemy, which used to, alchemy, you know, the, the goal, the one, one premise behind alchemy was the goal to, to the, the effort to try to create gold, to turn lead into gold, for instance. Um, but it was more than that. Alchemy really was the early chemistry, and it was a serious science. Uh, even though we think of it as having sort of occult inclusions, um, for the most part, it was fairly pure science. But alchemy was driven by the idea that all things were made up of various aspects of earth, air, fire, and water, and that by identifying and emphasizing certain ones of those, you could change the properties of a thing. Right? Makes sense. If something's made up of all of those, and you can increase the, the fire component and decrease the water component, you'll change what that is. So this is some of the early understanding of what, what things were made of, what the, what the nature of reality was. One of the basic challenges to metaphysics, what is the nature of reality, is... Again, you've read the stuff, the book talks about this. Understanding the apparent unity and diversity that exists in the world. Both, unity and diversity. The one and the many. I'm going to give you some examples of that in a minute. But the idea is, everybody's always recognized, until fairly recently, that there was both diversity of particular things, but there also were these groupings of things that seemed to be united, common. Again, I'll give you some examples of that. But, another way to put this question is, how is it that the many diverse things of the world can seem so different, and yet they seem part of universal subsets? How does this relate to the nature of reality? Now, and, and the book does a good job with the, the two dogs, Fido and Rover. But let me give you a couple of images to let you understand what we're talking about. We talk about diversity versus unity, the many and the one. Now, what are those? Dogs. How in heaven's name can you look at those two things and say they're both one thing? They're both dogs. Right? Mm -hmm. And yet, we see that right away, don't we? Now, you can say, well, they have four legs. Cows have four legs. They're not dogs. Well, they have two eyes, two ears, nose. I have two eyes, two ears, and a nose. I'm not a dog. What is it about those two things that cause us to immediately understand that they are in some way alike and yet obviously very different? Metaphysics deals with the fact that there is, has always been an understanding of this unity. There, there's a whole group of things called dogs. But the diversity is they can be as different as a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. You see that? Give you another one. What are these? People. People. How in heaven's name would somebody from another planet come here and know that that Maasai warrior, who's an old man, and this young Scandinavian woman are both people? And you, you know, they have different color skin, different color hair, different color eyes, different dress, different language, different locations on the planet. What makes them both people? And you can say, well, they've got two eyes, two ears, a mouth, four, you know, four extremities. Baboons have all those things. Nobody mistakes a baboon for a person. You know, some people argue that some of the higher primates, like like um, uh, the, the gorillas or the chimpanzees, may be related to us, but they still don't say that's a human being. Right? What causes us to both have the sense of the unity of those things and yet the diversity of those things? What how is reality constructed that allows us to perceive those things? And not only not be confused by it, but not even notice it. 
You understand that? Okay. Let me catch up with my notes here. I've got pictures of dogs and pictures of Maasai warriors, and pretty blondes and all kinds of things. Now, there have been historically three primary ways of trying to approach the nature of reality, and we're going to get into this. I'm going to talk about each of these three in various ways, including how they deal with the one and the many, the diversity, the, you know, the unity and the diversity. But three primary philosophical approaches to understanding the nature of reality. The first one, one of the oldest, philosophically speaking, is dualism. Dualism is the belief that reality is made up of two fundamental types of things, or substances, or realms, even. Plato, the first philosopher most of you would have heard of, um, was the one who really developed this most, most completely in, uh, in, in the philosophy of Platonism. There have been other kinds of dualism. Now, I want to make sure you don't understand, don't misunderstand. This is dualism in terms of a metaphysical belief system. It is not dualism in terms of, it doesn't apply to anything other than philosophical metaphysics. Um, for instance, there's a, a kind of dualism that believes that the world has two forces, good and evil, that are equal to one another and they're fighting each other. We don't, we don't believe in, in you know, that kind of dualism, the dualism of moral powers fighting each other. This is dualism in terms of how we understand the nature of reality, in the physical world especially. Okay? So dualism, that's the first one. The second is materialism, and I will say materialism is the dominant philosophy in the Western culture today. And so it's, it's important for us to understand this, and I'll probably talk about it more than the other two. Materialism is the belief that all that exists is physical matter. That's where they get materialism. It's not materialism, uh, material girl. No, no, no. It's not talking about money. It's talking about the physical reality of matter. And that so all that exists is physical matter and the laws that govern the behavior of that matter. So it will accept that there are some abstracts. We're going to talk about concretes. This is a concrete. An abstract would be the fact that I love my wife. That's not something that exists in space and time, per se, like this, this podium does. This podium is a concrete, it exists in space and time. An abstract does not exist in space and time, but we recognize it still as a reality. Well, materialism would say that the physical things and the laws that govern physical things are all that exists. So as the only abstracts they would accept are abstracts that help us understand how things, physical things interact. They would not perceive of love, as I just described it, as being a legitimate thing. They would say it didn't exist other than it was a chemical reaction that happens in my brain. Right? There has to be a physical explanation of materialism or they don't accept it. The third view is idealism. Idealism is the belief that physical matter doesn't even exist. And that all reality is made up only of ideas that exist in the mind. Okay? The ideals. Now, Platonism, or dualism, actually is a combination, it accepts both of those things. That there is a physical material world, a real, what we call particulars, and there is uh, a a world of ideas, or forms, Plato would call them, and we're going to talk about all that, that exists, both of those things. So you've got materialism is only the physical world, idealism is only ideas that exist in the mind, dualism says there's an aspect of both of those things, and here's how they fit together. Plato is the primary, although far from being the only advocate of dualism, a lot of modern philosophers especially, Thomas Hobbes was one of the first ones that really articulated it in terms of materialism, but that idealism, again, a lot of people have, have uh, spoken to it, but I agree with the book that, that Bishop George Barclay is the best example. And he was a bishop in the Anglican Church. Okay, we'll talk about how that works. Questions about those three major approaches in metaphysics to understanding the nature of reality. This is all stuff that's in the book, but I hope, hopefully, as I talk about it and break it down a little bit, it's easier to understand. Okay? Now, I'm going to spend a while talking about each of these three, and then we're going to talk about the idea of the, the one and the many, you know, the, the, diversi the unity and diversity. I'm going to talk about, metaphysically, how do we understand the universals, which are the ones, the dogs, the dogness, or the humanness, those big categories, of, or forms, as Plato called them. 
And then we're going to talk about the particulars, which are the diverse specifics that occur within those. Are we good? You understand everything I'm saying so far? Okay, that's where we're going. Let's talk about dualism. Dualism explains the challenge of the one and the many by proposing that there are two distinct aspects to reality. That's why it's called dualism, two, two aspects to reality. There is first the imperfect, changing temporal, temporal realm of the physical and material world, which contains objects that we experience with our senses. Now that's this, the physical world part of dualism is this table and this podium and me and that wall and our dog, the physical stuff that exists. And dualism says they really do, there is a physical world where real things do exist. And if you think that sounds silly to have to say that, not everybody agrees with that. The idealist would not agree with that, for instance, as you'll hear. So that's one world. This is what Kant called the noumenal. The real things outside myself that I may perceive. Okay. But then, dualism goes further and adds a second kind of reality, aspect of reality, or realm of reality, if you will. And that is that there is the belief that there is a perfect immutable, meaning not changing, and eternal spiritual realm, which is made up of forms, which that's what Plato called them, or universals. The, the ideals that exemplify and unite subsets of objects in the material realm and that don't exist in space and time. These are the concepts like dogness. This is the thing that allows you, you know, that the idea behind dualism, and Platonism being the most obvious example of it, is that when you see a Chihuahua and you see a Great Dane, the reason that you understand them both to be dogs is that in the, quite literally, spiritual realm, something beyond what we can experience with our senses, there is another realm that in which there is there are forms of dogness or humanness or chairness. I mentioned before, I actually went online and I could, I could have drawn this out indefinitely in terms of the number of examples. The number of things that we we look at and immediately understand that's a chair, maybe a funny looking chair, you know, from a barber chair to a to a recliner to a you know to a kneeler chair to everything else. Those are all chairs. We understand them to be chairs. Plato the dualists would have said that's because in the spiritual realm there is an aspect of chairness that all chairs fit into and that's why we perceive them that way. All dogs fit into this form or universal of dogness and we recognize that in them. Make sense? So beyond what the literal particular of things, there are conceptual forms or universals that exist in the beyond the physical world. And we relate we understand those things and we relate to them, we connect to them. Plato illustrated this with what he you know, with this allegory of the cave. Are you all you're all familiar with the allegory of the cave? Plato to, to demonstrate his, his principle, his ideas, he said it's as though there were three prisoners, and from birth they had been chained up in a cave. And not only chained up, but their heads are fastened, so the only thing they can look at is, a, is the stone wall in front of them. Behind them, there is a walkway, and beyond that walkway, there's a fire. And various people walk across that walkway, carrying things, having things on their head, and everything. And, and by the light of that fire, these three prisoners can see the images of their shadows cast on the wall, right? So they see these shadows moving by all day long, but they've never seen anything else. They can't even look at each other because their heads are fastened. Well, they begin to play this game where they say, uh, where they try to predict what's the next image that we're going to see. Is it going to be, you know, this, this shat is like a basket on the head? Although they don't know what a basket is, they've never really seen a basket. So they're just trying to predict what shadow form they're going to see come by. And whoever seems to get it right the most often, they all go, oh, well, you know, you're the winner, you're the master. As though being able to predict shadows constituted real understanding. Well, finally, one day, one of those prisoners breaks free. And he leaves the cave, gets out into the sunshine, and he sees the real world. He sees real people and baskets and trees and fruit. And he suddenly is aware of the fact that um, what he had thought was real, the shadows, were not real. That it was only a shadow of what was real. The real stuff was what was causing, was behind the shadows. 
And his allegory, this person, this prisoner broke, broke free, went into the cave and is trying to convince the other two prisoners who are still chained up, this isn't, the, this isn't real. This is, there is a real world out there, and it's, it's, it's dimensional, and it's colorful, and there are real things. The prisoners don't believe him. And they say if they get loose, they're going to kill him because he's lying to them. And they won't let him release them because they are completely addicted to only seeing the shadows. Plato said that's exactly where we are, that what we see in, in this physical world, these are actually only just the shadows. The real world, the important world, the three, you know, the multi-dimensional world is the spiritual world. It is more substantial, and it is from that spiritual world that we are only shown the shadows. This is very Christian. Okay? Uh, Plato, by the way, contrary to what most people think about Greek philosophers, Plato believed in one God. Right? That was not very popular back then. <laughs> so, this is his allegory of the cave. And basically, Plato proposed that the spiritual world is more real than the physical world that we perceive. But we are so addicted to seeing the, the shadows, which are the physical world, instead of the reality of the spiritual world, that we don't want anybody to tell us any different. And we think that whoever it is that can best master the shadow world, they are the maestro. You know, they are the people we listen to. When in fact, we don't even want to hear about the reality of the spiritual world, which is what is more real. Got that? So, um, so that's dualism. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Why, you know, what we have that we believe is in support of dualism. Dualism seems to provide the most accurate description and best explanation of what we humans experience and can know of reality, at least if we're objective. You know, dogness, humanness. There is something going on there that is different than the diversity that we experience in the particulars, the particular examples of those things. And I would, I would say as well that play, uh, dualism thinking there's a real world that is more important. When we think of abstract concepts which are not concrete, love, honor, loyalty, dedication, discipline, those are not concrete things. Those are not in the physical world. And yet, are those not the things that we hold to be the most real, the highest truths? Dualism gives us a clear understanding, consistent with most of our experiences, if we just pay attention to it, of what the differences are between the concrete physical world and the spiritual world where what's what's more real resides. Fair? You guys, most of you were just sort of, and I'm not sure if I'm going completely past you or if this is sinking <laughs> in. But you know, we'll see. If only part of it sinks in, you're still better than you were. Okay? Realism also readily explains the existence of the one and the many. As we said, the diversity and the constant change in the physical world, and yet our ability to perceive classes or categories or subsets or what Plato called forms of things that are larger than that. Dualism seems best able to accurately describe both our sensory experiences, color, sound, pain, those kinds of things, and the abstract and non-material aspects of our lives, which I just said, beliefs, desires, emotions, things like honor, love, loyalty, etc. Dualism gives us a way to understand those things as being real, part of reality, which is what metaphysics is, instead of figuring out what is reality. <coughs> Dualism also supports and grants permission for belief in the non-material world, including a belief in God and the human soul, and particularly the body-soul dualism. You know, we think of ourselves as Christians, we say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a soul that has a body. C.S. Lewis was very particular in saying, it's not that I, I'm a body that has a soul. I'm a soul, which is more real, that has a body, that body-soul dualism. We believe in life after death, etc. Dualism gives us the understanding, in case you haven't figured it out, dualism is where I am, and it's where most Christian are, Christian philosophers. There are some Christian philosophers who are idealists, and we'll tell you why. But most of us are dualists. We think Plato got it right. Okay? That's dualism. Any questions about that? It'll come in again a little bit later as we talk about particulars, but universal is particulars. But you're clear on that, what it is. Is this helping you compared to the book? I hope. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, work with me. We'll, we'll do it again. All right, let's talk about materialism.
Materialism is the, the philosophical approach to understanding reality that insists that the physical world and the laws that govern the physical world are all that exist. And that immaterial substances like God, angels, the soul, the mind, even things like love, uh, loyalty, honor, etc., that they either don't exist or that they can be explained as products of events in the material world. As I say, love is, is just a materialist, a pure materialist, would say love is nothing more than a chemical reaction in your brain. You know, um, loyalty is driven by a Darwinian sense of survival. If I'm loyal to you, it's because you're part of my tribe and you'll be loyal to me and defend me and so I'll survive better. They always have to find an explanation for everything that is either part of the physical world or part of the laws that rule the physical world. There is no spiritual in materialism. So materialism sees the universe as one massive machine which operates according to fixed physical laws. And it just, the two views are either that the, that the universe has existed forever, because nobody made it, or else it is a product of the Big Bang Theory, which just happened by chance. Interestingly enough, it used to be that all materialists believed in the eternal existence of the universe, until scientists began to demonstrate scientifically that the universe had a beginning, the Big Bang Theory, in which case they all did a flip-flop and came up with some way to figure out why the Big Bang Theory was supposedly a legitimate explanation for the physical material world not being created. Talk about that when we talk about what's the problem. Now, within materialism, there's a couple of terms you need to understand. One of them is hard determinism. This is the hardcore guys, as you might imagine from the name. Hard determinism is the materialistic view that all events are necessitated by the laws of physics. In other words, everything that is has that exists has to exist because the laws of physics demand it. Now, the result of that, as we say, creatures are neither free nor morally responsible for their actions. A hard determinist would say anything that is or anything that happens was necessary as a component of the material universe, or else it wouldn't be. And if that's true, I mean, I, after all, am not a moral being, because morality is not part of the physical world. It's not a material thing. I'm not a moral being. I'm just a combination of elements, 70% water, a bunch, you know, a lot of carbon. I'm a carbon-based life form, and all this other stuff. That I exist because the physical world demanded, necessitated that I exist, and anything that happens to me or that I do is necessitated by the demands of the physical world. And we, of course, go, what? But that is a not uncommon belief amongst materials. And obviously, if that's true, then I can't be held accountable for my actions. There is no morality. If I, you know, if I kill somebody and take their stuff, that's a manifestation of the law, of, you know, the, the, my right of survival. You know, the survival of the fittest, bread and tooth and nail. And so there actually is no moral consequence that should be held to that. That's, that you begin to see how this view of what is real is interpreted in ways that make a huge difference in how we act. Another word you need to know is nominalism. Nominalism is one aspect of materialism which insists that there are no forms, well materialism does, there are no forms or universals, there's no spiritual realm in which these things exist, but we simply have adopted certain conventions for naming similar things. The word nominalism or nominal means name. When we say somebody is a nominal Christian, it means they're a Christian in name only. When we say the Queen of England is the nominal head of the Church of England, that means she's the, the, the head in name only. She doesn't really do anything. Well, a nominalism says we have adopted certain conventions for naming things. I, did, I have, the convention is that that dog and that great Dane, we, we call them both dogs. But that's just a convention. We just agreed on that, and I learned that, and it, there's nothing inherently evident about it. I, the convention is just we're going to name things that way. And we've all bought into it. That's how materialism explains that process of seeing dog in both of those, in all of those different kinds of breeds, without saying there is some spiritual world where there's a universal or a form. Okay? Uh, other support for materialism. I'm trying to be fair here. Bob? A couple of questions. 
What would wind be? I'm sorry, what? What would wind be in this uh, materialism concept if you couldn't feel it or hear it? Well, you can't feel it. What, what if you could? Um, then they'd say it didn't exist. I mean, well, it, it, if, it, if you didn't feel it because you're just not in the right place. But they would say wind is what, it, what we would say wind is. And that is, it's an interaction between degrees of heat that cause air, which is a physical thing, you know, it's made up of, of elements, to move up or down and in the process create that air to be moving in, in certain ways. And so they, you actually can explain wind as a, a physical phenomenon. Okay. The other question is, in the materialism concept, uh, why would you have names for things that don't exist? Well, they're, they're just trying to find an explanation for what does exist, you know, for what is the convention. I mean, how is it that we name a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and a Cocker Spaniel and a Basinji and a, you know, Golden Retriever? They're all dogs. And they'd say, well, we just decided at some point in the past that, that we're going to call them that. All of those things are going to be part of that subset, and we're going to call it dog. So th that's their way to try to explain what is a, an actual occurrence in the world as we know it. But what, the reason they explain it that way is they're denying the fact that there is some dogness as a universal or as a form that would cause us to do that. They're saying, we just all agreed to do that. Carolyn? Well, it seems like then you, logically, at some point you have to say that everything is, is the same, right? And, yeah. and that it's arbitrary where we've made the division. So we could have made that that water cooler and um, my phone part of the same category. Yeah, those could be dogs. Yeah, because if we decided. It, yeah, and, and how, it would be very hard for normal people to recognize that those right. are simple. That's one of the complaints <laughs> against materialism. Oh, okay. How did you get there from here? Yeah. Okay, Pam. Who's we decided? Well, they just say that that society as a convention decided. For instance, and, and they would say, well, this concept of dogness. The concept in English is not the same as the concept in French, mm -hmm. okay, or in Spanish. In Spanish, you know, would be the concept of peroness, peroness, okay? <laughs> um, and so they would, you know, they, they, linguistics come into it, as it always does nowadays in, in terms of philosophy. Yes? Is that not just like saying, we consider that wall blue, uh, and somebody says, well, how do you know it's blue? Well, because we as human beings have we decided gave a label. that that is blue. Right. And it's just a point of reference so that we know what we're talking about. Well, that's what the materialists would say is true about everything, that we've just given it a label and we agree on it. Uh, but the fact is, going back to linguistics for a second, whether you say dog or perro or whatever language you want to use, whatever label you want to use, there is a universal sense in which there is a subset of beings that we've labeled that way. And the question is, did that label occur because something existed before that we recognized? Or did it occur simply because somebody at some time said, all of these things, we're going to call them dog. Materialists say somebody decided at some point in the past, all of these things, we're going to call them dog. And we all just went along with it, because by the time we got there, it had already been decided. Or that this is blue, or that this is black, or that my highlighter is yellow, whatever. Um, that's why materialism and dualism don't believe the same thing. They have different understanding as to where that came from. Materialism says it's just a convention. We just agreed on that label. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit more about what seems to make sense about materialism. Materialism would seem on the surface to be a more simple explanation. You don't have to have two realms, one of which you can't see. But rather that there is one reality, it's the physical world. And in that regard, it seems to be better qualified under the demands of Occam's razor. William of Occam lived at the end of the 1200s, early 1300s. He was a scientist philosopher, and he developed this, what's called Occam's razor, which is used in science and philosophy all the time. And it basically says, given all the possible explanations, the simplest explanation is almost always the, the right one. And the example I always use, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, right? Get that? The simplest explanation is almost always the right one. If you hear hoofbeats, if you hear hooves of an animal running down the street, you don't think zebra. You don't think, it's possible that sound could be made by a giraffe. No, 
99.99% of the time it's going to be a horse. The simplest explanation is almost always the right one. Now, Occam's razor is accepted as the final decision point, all other things being equal, and that's where we're running into a problem, is we have to decide are all other things equal. Occam's razor is like the final thing. If you've, got, if you've looked at all the aspects of two different opinions, ideas, philosophies, and if everything else seems to balance out, Occam's razor, I believe, is a viable way of saying which one is more likely. But first you have to decide that everything else is equal. And maybe it's not. Keep going. It is true that, uh, well, and this is not necessarily in support of, it's just a recognition of the fact. Materialism is most consistent with Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, which is the dominant scientific idea today. And let's face it, as a culture, we're driven significantly by science. That's why philosophy of science is one of the major philosophies being done today. Our world is, is very much driven by, influenced by, motivated by science. Well, materialism seems to fit in with the dominant scientific idea about how things got to this place, especially humanity. And so, um, Darwin's theory of, of evolution by natural selection is an example of naturalism. Naturalism says that all things are explained as a result of natural causes. We ought to be able to tell from that description that's exactly what materialism is saying. Everything is either physical or it has to do with the laws related to what is physical. There are no other explanations. Darwin's proposal of evolution by natural selection, it's a theory, a proposal, it's not a fact suggests that human beings came, and all species came, about by accident. Okay? So it's all materialist. There's no spirit, there's no creation, there's no you know, immaterial God, there's no none of that. So evolution, naturalism, scientism, that everything is explainable by science, fits right into materialism. In fact, they're almost synonymous with each other. Except that materialism can be used in philosophical arguments in some ways that science, scientism can't. Scientism, anytime you have an ism on the end, it means the extreme radical form of, like Islamism is the radical militant form of Islam. Scientism doesn't mean I'm against science, not by no means. But scientism means you rely on science as the only source of truth. That's what the logic positivists were that we talked about. The verification principle, if you can't prove it empirically by science, it can't be real, that's scientism. Also, one of the arguments for materialism is the belief in the progress of science. That's in, in parentheses or in uh, italics because that's a term, a concept. And that says that science continues to find explanations for the nature and operation of the universe. We learn more and more all the time about how things work scientifically. And that eventually, so they think, materialists think, eventually all explanations for how things came to be and how they work will come through scientific efforts to explain the material world. This is sometimes called the hypothetical theory of everything, which scientists, radical, more radical materialistic scientists believe that eventually we'll come up with a theory that explains how everything came to be. There won't be any questions or mysteries anymore. This is related to, although not exactly the same, as the, um, the unified field theory, which physicists have been looking for. The idea, you know, we have Gravitation is a field. Uh, magnetism you know, is, is, a, is a field. There are all these physical, uh, physical forces that exist, each one of which we define by some Newtonian or Einsteinian you know, explanation. Well, Einstein spent quite a few of the last years of his life working on a unified field theory. In other words, one theory, not a, not a separate theory about gravity, and one about magnetism, and one about the attraction of bodies and all that, but one field theory that would explain everything that all of those things would fit under it. And Einstein thought they'd find it. Well, that unified field theory is sort of a, a scientific field version of the theory of everything. That will, eventually, science will explain it all. There won't be any questions. There won't be any need to think about spiritual things or immaterial things or whatever. We'll figure it all out. OK? That's one of the things that scientists, many scientists, materialistic scientists, believe is going to be the case. So what are some of the problems with, with materialism? First, materialism absolutely does not allow the existence of any non-material being, so there cannot be a god, or angels, or a human soul, or any of that. So now, this, this is the philosophy of where atheists come from? Well, atheists would be primarily materialistic, yes. Okay, if they is think that, at all. Is that what the universities try to direct people toward? 
I, some. I, I don't know that I would generalize that much. I mean, that's the dominant direction. I mean, a, a, a materialist, um, I could use more, more terms in there, but a materialist viewpoint is the dominant one in the world today, partly because Darwinian theory and the idea of, you know, of the scientific explanation for everything is the dominant part of the science, and science is driving, is the most powerful force driving our culture right now, okay? So all those things relate to one another. But there is no room for a divine being or spirituality of any kind within the materialistic universe. I suggested this earlier, Occam's razor, which is used as a major, a major defense of materialism because it is the simplest, perhaps, of all the view three viewpoints. Occam's razor is only applicable for use as the deciding factor in the event that all the available options are otherwise equal in explaining a situation. And I don't think they are. Materialism, for example, fails exactly where all naturalistic attempts to explain the universe fail, because materialism maintains a naturalistic explanation of the universe. That is, it is logically impossible to believe that the universe came from nothing. No philosopher has ever proposed that something comes from nothing. Okay? That's why the materialistic philosophers used to all say, well, the, the universe has always existed. It didn't get created. It's always been there. Well, then science came along and decided that wasn't true, that there was a point at which the universe was created, the Big Bang Theory. So, it's illogical to say that the universe came from nothing, which is what they used to say, but that idea, it's impossible to say the universe came from nothing, also applies to the more modern idea in science of the Big Bang Theory. Because if we say the universe started with the Big Bang explosion of an extraordinarily dense speck of material, which came from where? So that too, the Big Bang Theory as well, while I may talk about the details of how the universe came to be from the Big Bang out, Still, it begins with the idea that something existed that came from nothing. Because they won't acknowledge, they won't accept the fact that it was created somehow. So whether it's always existed and came from nothing, or the universe began with the Big Bang Theory, that's also just a different way of saying it came from nothing. Neither of those has ever, in philosophy, been considered logically possible. Something does not and cannot come from nothing. You know, that's the idea of spontaneous generation. I remember one time, I, uh, I'm only the third person in history of my family as far as I know to go to college. So a lot of my relatives are not very well educated. And I don't hold that against them, that's just who they are. But I remember one time, I, hope I was with, my mother was there and a couple of aunts and cousins, and I opened a candy bar and there was some worm larvae in it. And I went, oh man, some worm is, you know, something has gotten into this and planted eggs and there's worm, and they go, one of my cousins it was said, oh no, that just happens. It just happened in there. I said, what do you mean? Well, it doesn't have to be something that planted an egg or anything. Those things just grow up in there. <laughs> and I said, well, no, that's spontaneous generation and that doesn't occur. And spontaneous generation, the idea that something can come from nothing, that some animal can be in there that didn't come from another animal anywhere, people who don't know any better still think that. But spontaneous generation, the fact that, that nobody believes that that's true, is another way of saying something can't come from nothing. There has to be some source for it somewhere. And materialism does not have a way of explaining the universe apart from suggesting, one way or the other, that something came from nothing. Science is unable, I mean, talk about, I said to you that the, for instance, the, they have a chemical explanation for love and affection and, you know, survival is the motivation of loyalty and all that. Well, they would say that the mind, the human mind, which we understand as an abstract, is simply the brain in action. It's the chemical processes of the brain create what we think of as a mind, which not only has the ability to perceive, but make judgments about, develop moral conclusions, which aren't real, but we think they are, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, science is unable, as I say here, to even begin to begin to conceive how the physical brain can be the same as the human mind or how any other concrete abstract connection can really occur. They can claim all they want to that love is just a chemical reaction, but nobody has ever come anywhere near close to being able to demonstrate that that's true. It's just sort of a, a, a self-defense against the idea that my physical brain is not the same as my mind. The chemical reactions in my brain are not the same as me having moral judgments or loving 
or have feeling loyalty or honor. Those aren't just, and if it is just chemical reactions, how is the chemical reaction for honor and love and loyalty, and those, we understand the difference in those, how are those different? There's nowhere near than being able to explain that. So materialism really is out on a limb and, and, and with no defense. And finally, materialism destroys any belief in or appeal to human moral responsibility or any moral values of any kind. If I'm just a collection of chemicals, and there is no such thing as morality, other than just what promotes the survival of the species, then if I can argue effectively that the survival of the species is going to be better served by me killing half of you so that the others have more to eat, there is no way in materialism that you can morally argue that that's wrong. I can do all kinds of stuff basing it upon purely materialistic, purely naturalistic kind of views with nobody legitimately being able to claim that there's a moral problem with that. You see the consequences? And yet, again, when we talk about the fact that, that this says, this denies the existence of God, this denies the existence of moral responsibility, there has never been, as far as we can tell, any cultures, now there have been sociopaths, perhaps, there has never been a human culture that did not have some concept of the divine, some concept of immaterial reality, or a clear sense that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. So how can we argue that that's not real from materialism when human cultures have always insisted on that? So for that, those reasons, materialism doesn't quite seem to work. I'm going to go through a couple more things and then we'll take a break. The idea of the progress of science, which is used as an argument for materialism, that eventually we'll figure everything out by science and there won't be any questions anymore. It's uncertain at best. And even if science pr does provide us a scientific explanation for all the physical aspects in the world, that still is not going to be a convincing way of understanding the non-physical aspects of the world. All the things we're talking about, love, loyalty, morality, etc. The conclusion that that's going to answer all the questions by the physical sciences simply don't, doesn't hold by any aspect of human experience or history. Materialism asks us to accept that the only real things are in the physical world without recourse to beliefs or concepts. And there's a good argument by Plantinga in here about this, in your book. It goes through several logical conclusions. And yet, materialism is itself a belief and a concept. And so by them asking us to believe materialism is true, they're asking us to accept a belief and a concept when by their own rules, accepting a belief in a concept, which is a non-material thing, can't happen. It is self-defeating, logically. That's the same thing with logical positivism. Remember I said that logical positivism says if you can't verify it scientifically, it can't be real, and yet you can't scientifically verify their, their claim of the verification principle. Materialism says that you can't have, that beliefs and concepts are not real things unless they are, they are uh, part of the laws that run the physical universe. And yet, materialism is a, concept, is a concept and a belief that you would have to accept in order to believe it's true. So it's self-defeating. You see, Carolyn? I, I do see, and aren't, aren't words concepts? I mean, they're, they're I, I know you said that linguistics has a lot to do with yeah. all of this philosophy stuff. It seems like, just starting right there, there, there's so many symbols and concepts and ideas that well, it seems kind of weird. and there are some in in the sciences of linguistics, and especially semiotics, which is the bigger the the uh, science of symbols, uh -huh. of which linguistics is a subset. But in the science of symbols, who would say that it is all convention? It is just everything is what we decided it was going to mean, without there being any inherent meaning to those symbols. And dualism, Christianity, for instance, don't agree with that. I want to give you one more, and then we'll take a break. The dependence of materialism on Darwinian evolution demands that human faculties and beliefs only exist as a result of natural selection. Okay, this is part of materialism. Mater materialism and Darwinian evolution by natural selection are interwoven. You can't tease them apart in the world today because they're so dependent on each other. That means that every belief that we claim to have, all right, which they say is just chemical reaction, every belief must be linked to and motivated by our instinct for survival. That is a basic principle of Darwinian evolution by natural selection. It's the only thing 
that survive, that, that is allowed, the only thing that moves forward, the only thing that continues, is whatever it contributes to survival. If it doesn't contribute to the survival of a species, it gets weeded out. And so, you would have to say that, that the, whatever beliefs we have are linked and motivated by our instinct for survival. But, that would mean that false beliefs, which also can be linked, you know, can promote our survival. And they have a very bad example. And he's got to think about the guy and the tiger, and the guy wants to be eaten by the tiger. That doesn't work. But let me give you an example of how a false belief can lead to survival. Suppose I had it in my head that my mind was being read by alien beings. To prevent my mind from being read by alien beings, I decided that if I build a tall metal tower, and from that tower I run lines down to the ground around my house, that the aliens you know, will not be able to read my minds because that tower, that metal tower and cables will prevent them from getting through to my house and read my mind. Well, there's a huge lightning storm. And a bolt of lightning strikes that tower, which then acts as a lightning rod, although that's not how I intended it. And the power is conducted out to the ground and dissipated. So my house is not destroyed, and, I'm, and I survive because of that. My survival in that case is based upon a false belief. I did all that because I thought the aliens were reading my mind, right? Well, if false beliefs can contribute to survival as readily as true beliefs, and survival is the point of Darwinian evolution, and therefore materialism, if false beliefs can contribute to survival as readily as true beliefs, then there's as much reason to think belief in materialism is false as to believe it's true. In other words, we have no way of knowing what's false and what's true. Materialism could just as easily be false as it is true. And so therefore, once again, materialism is logically self-defeating. Because they remove any concept as what is true and false. And if that's true, how can you tell me that your ideas are true? That materialism is true if you don't believe in such a thing as true and false. You can't argue it based upon survival because I can prove that false things can in increase my likelihood of surviving. So maybe your ideas are false. There's nothing to cause me to want to believe they're true. So why should I believe them? Let's take a break. So far we've talked about two of the three ways of perceiving reality. We've talked about dualism and materialism. Let's talk about the third now, which is idealism. Idealism asserts that physical matter does not exist at all, that reality exists only in the mind. And so idealism is the exact opposite of materialism. Materialism says that all, exi all that exists is the physical world with no, I, no mind. Um, idealism says the only thing that exists is the ideas of things that exist in the mind without any physical world, that there is no, no such thing as a physical existence. Now, the, a number of people have proposed this. The one that's talked about in the book that is the best example because he was the most comprehensive in, in presenting it is Bishop George Barclay, a bishop in the Anglican Church, the Church of England, in uh, the late 1600s, early 1700s, actually, it was the early 1700s is when he worked. He proposed that for a thing to exist, it must either be a perceiver, and you will remember we talked about Rene Descartes' idea that I think, therefore I am, the very fact that I am able to perceive and ask questions and think about things. If I can't believe anything else, I believe that means I exist. I am a perceiver, to use Barclay's word. That for a thing to truly exist, it must either be a perceiver or an idea which is perceived by the mind of the perceiver. Barclay denied that any matter exists outside a perceiving mind. There is no such thing as the physical world. Insisted that what exists inside the perceiving mind is nonetheless real. He said everything is inside the mind. There is no real out there. There is no noumena, to use Kant's word. Everything is phenomena, but still that's real. And this is somewhat similar to what Kant was saying, because Kant said that Cause and effect is real because our mind makes it real. Our mind creates it. Well, Barclay, and it's pronounced Barclay, not Berkeley. Barclay said that everything exists in the mind, but it's still real. The fact that it's not physical outside us in the, in the numinal world doesn't mean it's not real. It can be real if it exists in our mind. Um, the world then is not made of matter, but of ideas, and ultimately these ideas exist in the mind of God.
Barclay was a devout Christian. He was a bishop in the Church of England. And he believed the physical world doesn't exist and doesn't have to exist. The only thing that to make it real is it has to exist in the mind, and ultimately it has to exist in the mind of God. That everything that is, is an idea in the mind of God. And that God then allows us to have ideas in our minds, which for us is real. Got that? So everything is happening up here, and then above that, in the mind of God. That when... when when Genesis says, at the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he created it in his own mind, not in a physical space and time. Yes? I don't know if you're going to cover this, but then if everything exists in, in, the God, in, in God's mind, what happens with the evil then? We are concepts and ideas in God's mind, and then God has given us a mind with which we then can hold ideas as well. But if those concepts only come from God, is that what he's saying? Well, ultimately, well, yes, they are. only exist in, well, and we would say, to some extent, we would say that's true even if there is a physical world. All the physical world comes from God, too. So whether it's an idea or a physical thing, we would say it comes from God. Okay. He's saying that it all comes from God, it's all in the mind of God, but there isn't a physical thing. So let's, let's keep going, and I'll explain a little bit more about this, okay? Because it, it makes a lot more sense than you might think when you first hear it, <laughs> that there's no physical world. Um, in support of idealism, there is nothing in idealism that is inherently contrary to Christian belief. If you understand that when Barclay, when Barclay reads Genesis 1, and he says God created the heavens and the earth, he believes that God created it in his own mind. That he created it as an idea, not as a physical thing. And if you, if you accept that premise, now I think that you know, so much of what God describes, while it doesn't demand, it certainly strongly, strongly suggests that there is a physical, you know, a, a noumena, a physical existence outside ourselves. Um, but there's nothing inherently contrary in idealism to Christian faith. There are Christian philosophers today who are idealists. Okay? And, and some of them would say that this is a purer way because you're entirely, you know, looking to, there's nothing outside the mind of God, which in some ways is a very righteous way of thinking about it. Secondly, idealism affirms the existence of universal forms, though it views them as existing in the mind of God. In other words, this answers the, the one and the many, you know, the unity and diversity. That God, within God's mind, he has created concepts of dogness and humanness and chairness and all that. And then he has also created, within his mind and within our mind, specific examples or particulars of how that is manifest. So, both, so idealism has an answer to that, whereas materialism doesn't. The, the one and the many, right? The universal and the particular. Because what we perceive is not the real world, you'll remember Locke's representational theory of perception, the idea that what I'm getting, what I, what, and I look out the window, to say, you use this example, I look out the window and see a pine tree. I have to remember that what's happening is light is bouncing off that through my corneas, hitting my retina, creating a stimulus to my optic nerve, and a chemical reaction in my brain that causes me to perceive that. And yet, I'm not, that's not the real world. It's my perception of the real world. That's why, when you understand that, you can fully understand why people who have uh, damaged brains or chemical imbalances in their brain, why their perceptions are not what the rest of us perceive. It is for them. Reality is broken, is skewed, because all of that process by which we perceive things is broken. So, if, we, if what we perceive is not the real world, but simply what the, our filters, what's processed through us, our, it's our perceptions of what exists in the world. If that's true, and then we in fact cannot even conceive of any mind independent objects, I have, I have never and will never be able to reliably you know, demonstrate that there is anything in reality, apart from what I have filtered. That's the only, only way I have access to anything, is after it goes through the light bouncing off through my corneas, into my optic nerve, to my brain, through the nerves in my fingertips to give me stimuli that, you know, da da da. So I, I really can't even conceive of a, an aspect of reality apart from my processing all that. You understand that? Would part of your reality be, reality be that the fact that of all of us 
here would look at that tree and see that tree at the same time? Well, all I can say is that my perception, what gets processed through my senses, and the symbols that I use to describe it, appear on the surface to be consistent, or at least similar, to what gets processed through your senses and, and, and that you articulate in your symbols. If you're colorblind, and I see a green tree, and you see a red tree, there's a good example of what is real in that, in that case, other than what I perceive. And again, Barclay is right, that apart from what I perceive, I can't even conceptually, I, I can't conceive of anything existing apart from my mind observing it. Now that's hard, but I will never have actual real connection with any physical object. All I will ever have is whatever contact I can make with it through my senses. And I can say, well, that's real. Now, based on what? On the fact that the nerves in my hand are striking it, my skin is striking it, I have nerves, those nerves are processing in my arm, my brain is taking that in and saying, okay, you're hitting something. How many filters is that going through before I have a conception of that? I cannot conceive of anything apart from my filtering a perception of that. Chris? Well, on this theory, you're, this theory then says it's all in God's mind, but, but does, does it, how do I know it's not more than just me? Like, how do I, you know, you and you and everybody else really isn't here, it's just me. Solipsism. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of, but obviously these who, people who believe this believe that you're a mind and she's a mind and everybody else is a mind. Well, as long as we believe, as Barclay did, that God is the great mind, right. that He has given us minds and He has given us ideas in our mind, then we're fine. There actually is a philosophical school called solipsism, which believes that everything is the construction of my mind and nothing exists apart from my mind. And actually, one of my professors in seminary, he said that he was a, he was a, uh, he had been hired as a philosophy teacher at a college, and the chair of the philosophy department was a solipsist, meaning he believed that nothing was real except for what he had created in his own mind. And he said that he went to one of the other professors in philosophy, and, and when he found that out, he said, have you guys not tried to talk him out of that? And the professor grinned and said, oh no, because if he goes, we all go. <laughs> okay. So yes, that is a radical version of this. <laughs> but the reason why we use Barclay's example is because Barclay doesn't fall into that because he says there is a higher level of idea in the mind of God of which we then benefit and participate in. Okay? But the idea is that if, not, if I never really have anything except for my perception of reality, that's the all closest I can get, and that I can't even conceive of mind-independent objects, then philosophically speaking, metaphysically speaking, the existence of physical matter is both unnecessary and even absurd. Since the only thing I experience of reality is what's in my mind anyway, based upon optic nerves and, you know, and touch the nerves of my fingertips and all that, then why? It's, it's only in my mind, so why does there have to be a physical world if God has put those ideas in my mind anyway? It's the Matrix. Yeah. It's it the is. movie, The Matrix. It's basically that what is real to you is what you perceive. And, 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 and I mean, Descartes talked about the evil genius. The Matrix is this machine that's taking advantage of people, you know, to siphon off their energy or whatever. Barclay's basically saying the same thing could be true except as the product of a benign God. He's not doing it to hurt you. This is just how he created it. Okay. You don't have to agree with all this. I, I'm not an idealist. I'm a dualist, okay? If the apparent conflict between a real, noumenal, outside me world and our perception of it doesn't exist, which is what Barclay says, there is no difference. It's all ideas in my mind. If there is no difference between an outside real luminal world and what I perceive, then the skepticism that arose from our unproven perceptions, that is Hume and Kant, you can't really know. How can you know? You don't know. All you get is your perceptions of the world. You don't know if that's real. You may be getting it wrong. Your filters may be broken. Well, according to Barclay, if the only reality is my perceptions, then you can't challenge my perceptions as being inaccurate to the real world because there is no real world apart from my perceptions. And so he sidesteps, in a quite logical way, 
all of the radical skepticism that Hume and Kant and others had proposed that prevented us from believing that we can know anything for sure. And so he answers the big epistemological questions. How do we know? Interesting, huh? And Barclay would say we can remove the idea of a material world from our concept of reality, and the world we experience would be unchanged. We could go right on with it only being ideas in our minds and ultimately in the mind of God, and nothing would change for us. This is basically the Matrix. Nobody who's in the Matrix knows that it's not real. And you remember the scene in the Matrix where the guy who betrays them, he said, dang, I wish I hadn't taken that red pill, or whether, you know, blue pill, whichever it was. Because he ultimately decides I was more comfortable when it wasn't real what I thought it was. Right? Well, Barclay's saying, there doesn't have to be a real world, and for you to be very comfortable and satisfied, and for everything to go along just fine, thank you very much, with ideas in your mind and ideas in God's mind. So okay? you could create your whole reality. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I truly love that story about the philosophy professor saying, yeah, but if he goes, we all go. Again, Mark, you could say, well, it's not just his mind, it's not just our mind, it's the mind of God. All right, now, I want to talk a little bit about how we understand and describe the world. And we're going to talk about universals and particulars. Universals are the one or the big forms, the, the um, oh, Mr. I skipped one. Mr. Page. I did. Problems with idealism. There is a lot to, a lot to recommend idealism. You know, there really is, especially for Christians. I mean, it's, it answers a lot of questions, although I don't believe it's accurate. The problems. One, most arguments for idealism hinge, hinge upon the representational theory of perception. The idea that my perceptions of the real world are only my perceptions. Everything is so filtered, I can't know the real world. So, arguments in favor of idealism are weakened if we assume that there might be, or, or even work to think, there might be a different mode of perception. If the representational theory of perception is not true or accurate, then idealism isn't as demonstrable. Right? Got that? Because if there's some other way for me to perceive reality other than just, if there's something else going on than just my filters taking something into my mind, then questions arise. Some philosophers favor what's called direct realism, which proposes that we experience external material objects, the noumenal, immediately and directly rather than representationally as ideas. If this is correct, idealism fails. And you go, now wait a minute. But, the light bounces off the tree, goes through my cornea, strikes my retina, goes through my optical nerve. There it is. You know, all those filters in there. How can you talk about direct realism? Well, the philosophers who maintain direct realism would say that there are what they call causal intermediaries, which are my retina, my optic nerve, my brain. That those do, there are perceptions that are processed in that, but that because we're not aware of those intermediaries, we, in effect, do experience the external world directly and not just ideas about that world. In other words, there really is something there, and I really, I, I really am aware of the real something there, no matter what filter it went through. Now, my filters may be broken. They may not be accurate. But the argument there in direct realism is there really is something there, and I'm perceiving the something that is there, and what filters it has to go through to get to my mind doesn't really matter. All right? Because those are causal intermediaries, but I'm not even aware of those things. That's why most people, without thinking about it, assume that when I look at something, well, of course, I see it right there, it's real, as though they're just looking through a window glass. Without thinking about retinas and optical nerves, etc., the direct realist would say, that there is a practical truth behind that perception. There is a real thing, and I really am directly experiencing it, and the intermediary effects of optic nerve and all that, unless they're broken, do not mean that I'm not experiencing a real thing. So that is a major argument against the concept of idealism. And it's sort of a common sense argument. You know, philosophy, in its best, in its best days, legitimately appeals to common sense. Common sense being what most people have believed makes sense at most times. Carolyn? And it's common sense, too, in, in that it's not just 
sight that makes me know you're there. I can hear you. Exactly. I can touch you. I get multiple witnesses in my senses. Exactly. You know, the combination of things. Yeah. Exactly. And the testimony, you know, somebody else can say, oh, and I, I saw, saw your husband too. Ross the other day, yeah. you know, etc. So, yeah, there is a sense in which um, I, I believe there is something to this. I mean, I believe that direct realism is probably a more accurate way of talking about how we perceive the physical world than idealism is. That doesn't mean we don't have ideas in our mind, and it doesn't mean that they're not ideas in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes a really um, good basis for the transformation of when you die and, and now you have a, your spiritual being. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, materialism, or I'm sorry, idealism gives you that, but so does dualism. This is not the only alternative for believing in the spiritual. Materialism doesn't. And so we, you know, we have to uncheck that box right away in terms of our, our belief systems. This class, while it's predominantly philosophy, it is called philosophical theology. And our theology says that we will not, we cannot accept a system that, it, that prima facie, that means on the face of it, but immediately will deny the existence of God or the spiritual. Okay? But both idealism and dualism allow us like Barclay, his whole, all of Barclay's idealism, and there's other kinds of idealism that don't accept the existence of God, don't focus on the mind of God as much as Barclay did, like solipsism, you know, that it's all just mine, you guys belong to me, it's in my <laughs> head, okay? Um, and, and I can remember um, during college days when I was really beginning to get into this stuff, that was one of the questions I used to say is, how do I know that this isn't just something I made up? And, and I had a girlfriend at the time, I talk about those things, and I struggled with them. And she'd say, you know, you're going to go freaking crazy if you don't stop that. Okay. Um, maybe I did. I don't know. Um, let's keep going. Let's talk about how we understand and describe the world. And I'm going to sort of take bits and pieces of all of these. Dualism, idealism, materialism, and talk about first universals and... and the next, the next several slides, I confess, the next 20 minutes, is going to be kind of a, um, a comp, just a loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires and babies. I'm just going to give you a lot of stuff in terms of terms and things that are loosely connected. As we talk, but the main premise behind it is how we understand and describe the world in terms of universals, the ones, and um, the particulars, which are the minutes. Those are the terms we use, universal particular. In fact. Well, dualism and idealism propose the existence of universals. That's what uh, is called abstract forms by Plato. The immutable abstract forms that exist outside space and time that Plato would say was in the spiritual realm, all right? Like dogness or chairness or humanness, okay? Materialism doesn't accept that, but both um, Dualism and idealism give us the, the allow, allow us to believe in the universals. Concrete objects, and these are just some definitions. Concrete objects are the things that we talk about existing in the physical world, in time and space. Abstract objects or concepts do not exist in the physical world, in time and space. And I, I, I give you this because um, when we talk about, like, I, I talk about particulars. Well, a particular can be either concrete, this podium, or a particular can be the feeling of love I have for my wife right now. You know, but, but one is concrete and the other is abstract. So when you talk about particulars as opposed to universals or forms, there still are subsets of those. So concrete is a physical object in space and time. Abstracts are, or concepts sometimes it's called, are not in space and time, they don't exist in the physical world. And when you start trying start trying to describe and understand the world, you need to understand that those things are not the same. And so we have terms for them. Properties are the characteristics or qualities of a thing. Right? The obvious ones are our dog is black and white. Our dog is a, you know is about this tall. Okay? Our dog does not bark. Those are properties of our dog, okay? So any characteristic or quality of a thing, now it doesn't have to be a concrete thing, you know? Um, my love keeps me up at night, okay? There can be properties or characteristics of even abstract things, okay? His loyalty is inspiring to me, that's a property. Now, these bugs are biting my legs, those are properties. Relations are other kinds of universals that reflect how things are in relationship to one another. Okay. 
Um, they're, they're universals because they're not, they're not themselves concrete things. This podium is to the right from my perspective of that podium. This podium is slightly taller than that podium. I am eight hours older than my wife. Those are all descriptions of relationship. How two things are in relation to one another. Those are called relations. And again, I say, including relative size, direction, age, etc. When we describe the present specific relations between objects, we express relational properties. Okay. Um, when I say I am eight hours older than Carolyn, that's a relation. When I say my age is such that it is eight hours more than Carolyn's, you hear the difference in those two things? One of them is describing the relationship between us, and one of them is identifying the existence of a relation that, that happens to occur. All right? You know, Chris is taller than Florette. Chris has the characteristic property of being taller than Florette. In one case, I'm talking about the relationship between those two things. In one, I'm identifying some characteristic that Chris has. It happens to be that's in that's a relationship property that he's taller than. Okay, there's a subtle difference there, but when you get into and I don't expect you all to, you know, to get hopefully you understand it at first. You may get confused by it, you may not carry it. If you follow up as we proceed with philosophy in this class, and then later if you start thinking about it, those kinds of things like the difference in relations and relational properties can make a difference. And I'm just introducing you to that. Okay? Particularly because it was in the book. And I couldn't just skip it or else I'd, I would have left you confused. But in one case, I'm talking about two, you know, two things in relation to one another. And the other, I'm identifying something that is a characteristic or property of one of those people that is a reflection of a relation. Okay? Um, propositions are another kind of universal, which is the content or meaning of a statement about an object. Now, propositions sometimes just mean statement. But proposition is another way of saying... Of, of, uh, talking about the content or meaning of a statement about an object. If I say, you know, Chris is six foot two inches tall, I have made a proposition which describes a property of Chris. I've made a statement about the property that he, he holds. Again, don't, don't get hung up on this stuff. Objects have properties, this, maybe this will help, they have, you, they have properties, they stand in certain relations to one another, and they express certain propositions or truths, okay? Some, some aspect of themselves. All right. Let me talk about a couple of examples um, that are parts of materialism. That, and these are important because you're going to see something of, uh, from this <laughs> in terms of practical application. Extreme nominalism is one type of materialism, fairly common today that denies that the existence of properties and relations exist, they, they deny it altogether. There is no such thing as properties or relations because they don't believe in universals. They only believe in concrete objects and what we call them. That's the nominalism part. Extreme nominalism proposes that all objects simply belong to sets of things that we've decided to group together. We talked about that earlier. We say dog, and we just decided all those things are in a dog are in dogs. But they're only dogs as concrete objects. There are no conceptual things behind that. You can't have dogness. <laughs> you can only have dogs. You know, there's three dogs here. There's no sense in which there's a dogness about them. Carolyn? Would they argue the same thing even if it could be proven that that's like hardwired into people and not the tabula rasa? Right. For, because, for example, maybe I'm just misperceiving things, but I think my dog can tell the difference between dogs and cats, or between... And horses. And horses. Um, so it, it's not just what human beings have decided to group together. It seems to be something... Well, the interesting thing about, about scientific materialism is that more and more and more we're finding, we're finding scientific evidence that what they're proposing is not accurate. For ah. instance, <laughs> we're, well, I would say that. They would not say that. Yeah, of course. We are finding more and more evidence that a belief in the divine, some belief in the supernatural, is hardwired into human beings. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you can't. I mean, dogs are great pets. Right. Well, well there is that too, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. There is a uniqueness about them. Yeah. And in fact, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane can't can breed. It's not easy. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Um, and so, and so, there's a sense in which there is a physical, scientific sense of dogness. But extreme nominalism says that nothing exists other than the concrete objects. And if we decide we want to lump them together and call them dog, then that's just because we decided to do it. There's nothing else there. Okay. There are no <coughs> properties or or relations that exist apart from a real thing. Hmm. I can't say this is a really beautiful example of a music stand. Because when I said that, I proposed a form, like a set, music stand. They would say, no, this is this music stand. You can say, I like this. This, is, this music stand is good. But you can't say there's a larger set than this of music stands and that this is one of them. You only deal in concrete objects, not in concepts of objects. Now, a lot there are people, especially scientific materialists, who maintain that. Another a, a softer version of that nominalism is called moderate nominalism or trope theory. It admits that things have properties. It doesn't deny all properties. See, an extreme nominalist would say, you can't say that the properties of this are it's black and this is tall and has holes in it. It just is what it is. And you can't describe it as having properties. That's just a, that's a false way to approach it. That's extreme nominalism. Moderate nominalism will admit that it has properties, but maintains that uh, each abstract property or trope defines the object in its entirety, completely. Now, let me explain that by comparing it to Platonism. Platonism would say that all red apples are reflecting the universal property of redness. That there is some, we see something, and whether it's a, you know, whether it's a dark pink, or, you know, a, whatever the range of red is, and there are scientific explanations for that in terms of wavelength of light. But whatever that is, the idea of Platonism, or in dualism or idealism even, is that there is a universal concept of what constitutes redness. The trope theory, or moderate nominalism, would see every red apple as a discrete object, which we may or may not choose just because we prefer it or it's more convenient. We may choose to gather those things together as a set that we call red apples, but their common redness is nothing more than a brute fact that cannot be explained. You can't say all of these are part of a universal form of, that, of redness, or even that a Macintosh and a Granny Smith and a Golden Delicious and a whatever are all a form of apple, you know, form being the technical philosophical term. They'd say no. This is a green apple that we call a Granny Smith, and this is a red apple that we call a Red Delicious, and this is a red and yellow apple that we call a Gala. There are no larger groupings than that. Every, everything is a unique, concrete aspect. Don't, and if you, if you decide that all of those fit under some subset that you call redness or you call apple or you call whatever, that's just a matter of convenience. There's nothing really there. Let's keep going. I got ten more minutes to rock, rock your world. Okay. We also talk about essences or essential properties. Those are the universal properties without which a thing could not exist. Being a dog, being a human. The example I use in there is that Socrates. The essential property of so being human is an essential property of Socrates. If he were not human, he wouldn't be Socrates. There are certain things that, that, you know, he has a physical body. If he didn't have a physical body, unless you're an idealist, then, <laughs> then he couldn't be Socrates. But then we also have non-essential properties. Those are properties which are not necessary for the existence of a thing. Having red hair, being tall, having a pug nose, I think they talk about Socrates. You know, those are the things that we change when we go to the plastic surgery. It doesn't, I don't stop being me. The essential properties are such that if they didn't exist, I couldn't, you know, in me, I couldn't be me. I'm human, I'm, you know, whatever else, the essential properties. The non-essential properties are accidental, they're sometimes called, are the properties that without which, if I change them or they get changed for me, I'm still who I am. I'm, I'm still me, right? Or our dog is still our dog. You know? um, 
both extreme nominalism and trope theory, the two we were just talking about, reject the idea of the existence of universals. And so, because they don't have universals, they reject the idea of essential properties. There are no essential properties. Everything is an accidental property. If there are no universals, no big sets, then nothing, there's no such thing as humanness, or dogness, or chairness. They reject that, which means there's no such thing as essential properties. Either everything's an accidental property, or everything's an essential property. There's no distinction between the two. And they go in the direction, those, those beliefs, of saying everything is an accidental property. Now, why does that matter? <laughs> Let me tell you. The consequences of this rejection of essential property has radical ethical consequences. If there are no essential differences between a person and a tree, there is no justification for valuing the life over, of a person over the life of a tree. Okay. If you don't believe that there is something about personness or personhood which is unique and essential and fundamentally different than treeness or treehood, if you don't believe there's any essential characteristics, any essential properties, then you don't believe that there's any difference in those things, and therefore it is not possible to make a value judgment in favor of one against another. You want to know how this applies? In our culture, we say, we have decided that a fetus does not have any inherent personhood. There is no inherent sense in which that conceived being in the womb is a person because personhood, we've decided, is not an essential characteristic, but rather is a contingent or accidental characteristic based upon circumstance. Personhood of a fetus is determined on whether or not the mother wants it, or whether or not the fetus is going to have the color hair we want, or any number of other reasons, or it would be an embarrassment, or I'm not prepared to deal with that much work. Those are all contingent reasons. Why we decide the fetus can be aborted because we have first decided there's no such thing as inherent personhood. It's why we say that, you know, at various times, humanity has said people who are severely mentally retarded should be euthanized because they don't meet the requirements, we think, of being a full person. Or, why slavery was justified because African dark-skinned people are not persons. They don't meet the qualification of essential property of personhood. Mm. Do you see the ethical ramifications that come from that? Mm. The reason why we have so much trouble in our culture right now, ultimately, philosophically, metaphysically speaking, the reason we have so much trouble with the issue of same-sex marriage is because we used to have an inherent concept that marriage was had an essential property to it. And because we no longer believe in essential properties, everything is up for individual determination. So many of the moral issues that we struggle with in our culture go back to the fact that things that used to be considered inherently, essentially characteristic as a form or universal no longer are perceived as that. Do you see why this is important? We believe that it's up to every person to decide is that accidental or non-essential property of value to me or not? If it's not essential, by definition, it must not be critical. I can decide I don't like it, so I'm not going to go with it. As opposed to an essential property without which something cannot exist. The question would be, if marriage, for instance, no longer has an essential property, then does marriage, as we have historically, traditionally understood it to be, does it any longer exist? So Serious stuff. Well, can you totally redefine it, whatever we wish to do? Well, but if we redefine it, then it's not essential. Okay? Because the nature of essential things is they don't change. If, if they're not there, something can't exist. The definition of an essential property is without it, the thing which is being described cannot exist. You see why this can be important and how we think? All right. A couple of other terms. I got four minutes. <laughs> Conceptualism, uh, actually, I'm not going to do that. Um, 
let's talk about this instead. Uh, I want to skip to what are particular things. We've been talking a lot about universals. What are particular things? The, the, you know, as opposed to the forms, the universals, the either concrete or abstract particulars. A particular is an individual thing of some kind, whether it's an inanimate object, a living organism, an artifact, or a supernatural being. Or even, you know, it can be, when I say it, and uh, I didn't add this, but an abstract. You know, we would say that, that honor is a particular because it's a concept that we have a clear sense of understanding of. There are two, and you're really going to get confused with this. If you were in the book, I hope it makes it better, but there are two principles that exist that are used to help us understand the nature of particulars. One of them is called the principle of indiscernible, indiscernibility of identicals. The principle of indiscernibility of identical says that if two things are really only one thing, which is called numerical identity, then they will have the same properties in common. We studied in the laws of logic, we talked about the law of identity. Something is what it is. A equals A. This is another way in metaphysics of saying that. My explanation to help you understand that is, is and that's why I put quotes around it, this is Ross speaking. Don't be fooled by different names for the same thing. The example that we use in the book is Cassius Clay and Muhammad Ali. He changed his name. He was still the same particular. Same essential qualities, etc. Okay? Don't be fooled by different names for the same thing. In metaphysics, we say that's the principle of indiscernibility of identicals. That is considered a universal truth. Philosophers don't question it. The same way they don't question the law of identity. Something is what it is. We just have a funny way of saying it. If two things really are one thing, they will have the same properties. And you say, well, 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 what two things if they're one thing? Uh, and yet it is. Something is what it is. That's the point. And the reason I say don't be fooled by different names for the same thing is because the different names may look like two things, but they're only one. The second principle is the principle of identity of indiscernibles. Oh, yeah. It sounds like you reached down the first one's throat and pulled it, pulled it out. <laughs> the principle of identity of indiscernible says that if two or more objects have the same properties in common, which we call qualitative, not numerical, which was the first one, but qualitative identity, you can identify the same qualities. They are the same thing. This principle is not true. And my explanation for it is just because two things appear to be the same does not mean they are the same. Example, they have several examples in the book, like um, on the manufacturing line for Barbie dolls. Two Barbie dolls come off the same lot, same time, right next to each other. By any observation, you cannot tell any difference in them. They appear to have all of the same qualitative characteristics. Are they the same thing? No. And yet, this idea gets us in trouble. Because people see things that look the same, or that they perceive to be the same, maybe they make the assumption that they're the same because they have the same parent qualities, and it leads us in wrong directions. Okay. Now, do you mind if I go like five minutes over? Are we okay? Bundle theory relates to this. Bundle theory, and here we're talking about how what properties exist. You know, we're talking about properties of things when we say numerical identity having the same properties or qualitative uh, identity having, you know, having the same properties in two things versus one thing. Bundle theory is one of the ways that we identify particulars. It's one of the theories that we particular, uh, identify particulars. The bundle theory maintains very simply, simply that a particular thing is nothing more than the sum of its properties. This uh, stand, music stand, does not exist apart from the fact that it's this tall, made out of metal, painted black, with holes in it, and adjustable, etc., etc., etc. That there is nothing here, does not exist apart from the sum of those properties. Okay? Rather than the idea that properties are something that it has. See the difference? So bundle theory says the sum of the properties makes up the thing in total. Included in that, as one aspect, is what's called the Mariological Essentialism. See, that three times fast. Mariological Essentialism demands that every property of a particular thing is essential for that thing to exist. If this is the sum, this only exists as the sum of all of its things, of all of its properties, and I paint it white, 
According to Mariological Essentialism, it's no longer the same thing. I haven't just changed one property, I have created a whole new thing. Because it no longer has all of the net, what's, you know, of the properties that made up that thing when I started. There's no, in other words, there's no distinction, according to Mariological Essentialism, which is part of bundle theory, there's no essential, uh, uh, distinction between essential and accidental properties. So that if anything changes in the properties of a thing, it becomes a completely new thing. All right? I am not the same particular person I was before I lost my hair. Or before I lost two hairs this morning. Yeah. I am a completely new thing. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> now, they're, they're, I'm going to tell you the ramifications for this, but back to those laws. Most metaphysicians, most people who practice metaphysical philosophy would maintain that this Mariological essentialism is a false application of the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. In other words, that the sameness of two things is a factor of qualitative identity, appearance, of two or more objects. In other words, if I believe that by changing some aspect of the appearance of this thing, by changing a property, then I have created a new thing, it's because I don't believe that one thing can have change properties, okay? Sameness, not changing, is seen as a qualitative identity or appearance of two or more objects. Anything I change about this makes it a completely different thing. Well, do we believe that's true? Yes. No. Is it a completely different thing? If yes. I take a basketball and I take all the air out of it, I've taken away one of the properties. But if you take that stand and you paint it white, and you look at it, someone could come and say, I want a black stand, but they'll see a white and they'll say they're two different Okay, colors. but if I painted this white, the same white, what happened to the black stand that was right here before? Well, it's still there, but... Uh, no, 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 not according to Bible theory, not according okay. to Mariological Essentialism. It no longer, the old one no longer exists. The only thing that now exists is the white one. Is the white one. But someone walking in, never having seen the black one, will assume that it's an entirely different stand. Okay. So how does that work? Well, but then you're talking about percept, you know, uh, not the change in the thing. We're talking about the particulars, but rather the perceptions that people would have when they come in. Okay. Now, this there are ramifications to this in terms of when you. This is denying the idea of essential properties, which means the whole bundle theory goes back to the idea that if there are no essential properties, there are no universals. There is no such thing as personhood. There's no, you know, I can't say well. This is still a music stand. It used to be a black music stand, but now it's a white music stand. They would say, you can't say that. The only thing you can say is, right now, I have a music stand. And it is this music stand. You paint it white, and you can say, now, that old music stand doesn't exist anymore. Now I have this music stand. There are no universals. And again, it feeds back into this idea. If there are no universals, if there are no forms concepts like personhood, doghood, if there are no qualities that, that don't change, no matter if you change this. The idea is, if I change the surface of something, have I really fundamentally changed the nature of that thing, or have I just changed one little visible part of it? Bundle theory, Mariological Essentialism would say, the old thing no longer exists. There's only this new thing. So don't, you know, don't even go there. Two other views. And we'll get into some of this stuff later, very quickly. The substratum view of reality proposes that beneath the properties of a thing, there exists something that is not itself a property, or a substratum, which itself has no properties, but on which other properties reside. That there is some aspect to which, you know, bundle theory says this, is on, this music stand is only a combination of the various properties. It's metal, it's black, it has holes in it, it extends, it's got three legs, etc. Substratum theory, or view, says there is a conceptual music stand that exists here on which are the, the properties exist that I can perceive. The blackness, the metalness, the holes in it, the three lights, etc. Again, that's going back to the idea that there is some reality underneath the properties that we perceive. Is that the same as a form or no? Well, it's, 
it doesn't buy, it subs, the uh, substratum view does not buy fully into Platonism, but it, it goes there. The idea is there is something that exists that is more real on which the physical properties just reside. Platonism, dualism, tends to think more that, that the reality of that thing exists somewhere else and we are aware of it. This actually says that underneath this physical thing somewhere, there is a conceptual thing that is real. That the very fact that I conceive of it as a music stand, no matter what the specific properties of it are, you could even say music stand as a name is a property, but that something exists there apart from what I can perceive as the properties. And the last one I want to talk about is the substance view of reality. You can read more about these things in your book, by the way. I told you this last section is going to be mostly just terms. The substance view of reality says that the concrete particulars of a thing should themselves be taken as its most fundamental in, uh, entity. That a thing, or at least, and they, and they differentiate between natural things, they call it, which are living beings. That those living beings, natural things, exist in their wholeness as a basic and irreducible entity or substance. In other words, um, according to the substance view, if we took our, if, if our dog was taken to be neutered, the dog that came back would not be the same fundamental entity that we took, we took to the back. Okay. That we have to look at the thing as a whole. You lop off parts of it, it's no longer the same whole, it's a different whole. So in some extent, that's, you know, there's a relationship there between that and the mariological existentialism. Is, is, is this getting to the point where, as a person has more, parts uh, manufactured parts but in their body at some point they become different and reach a point where they're no longer a human versus a, a machine basically well I followed you up into the part you said they no longer become a human because, because that's they're not trying to determine in that this is where they are now trying to determine that when a person has excess amounts of, of manufactured parts in their bodies do they are they now defined? They're, they're coming to that terminology. Well, it's, it's true. I mean, that's true to the extent, I don't know about added parts, but it is true. The question of quality of life and the survival of people who are in life-sustaining uh, machinery, all of the legal arguments that have gone on about can we unplug this person? And is that murder? Is that mercy killing? Is it killing at all? All of those boil down to questions about what constitutes a human life. Mm -hmm. is, is the personhood, the essential property of personhood, dependent upon quality of life? Because that's a qualitative question, not an essential question. The quality of a life is an accidental property, not essential for existence. Whether a person is well-fed or poorly fed, smart or dumb, you know, tall or short, those are not essential characteristics. Whether they're enjoying their life or not enjoying their life, that's, those issues are not essential to whether or not that, that person is a person, if we believe in essential properties. Because so much of our culture, without knowing it, without thinking about it, and that's why we're studying this stuff, is because most people don't even, have never thought about this without realizing that we have stopped believing that there are such things as universal essential properties, it has led us to draw conclusions about how we treat other people. Well, they have such a poor quality of life, we, we shouldn't let them, you know, we're, we're going to end their life mercifully. Have you not then just made a statement about what you think constitutes a person, that their quality of life, their ability to enjoy it, their ability to be independent, all of that, are you not then saying that those are just as important as the inherent, universal, essential character of what it means to be a human being and that human life should be preserved? I think you are. And that's a huge deal. Which is why we're talking about this stuff.